Lovely, thanks Katie. Um, I have seen uh, one question so far, so please do post some questions if you haven't already done so and if you're sitting on something that you want to ask. Um, one thing I have seen was sort of largely in response to something that Ruth said, but um, applies to everyone I think and it's it's around that that balance of accessibility and I'm really pleased that actually all of our people speakers mentioned things about being accessible and thinking about what limitations people have to engaging with the different outreach activities that you're doing and the question very much links to that and it's how do you strike that balance between people with limited internet access need things to be recorded so that they can access it later and against how what permissions and things that you need to be able to record a session. So how I think we'd start with Ruth because she specifically mentioned that she was doing that. But um, what what have you done to sort of strike that balance? Hi, Sam. My, um, it keeps telling me that my internet is unstable, so I'm sorry if, um, if this doesn't work very well. Um, it's working well by voice at the moment. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I think where we can for recording sessions, we're trying to do so um, without the young people um, being involved or editing it in such a way that it is the you know it's the presenters um various academics and students involved in the in our work and and not those students um for the some the summer schools haven't happened yet so um when how it, it is one of those very difficult issues um to try and have something that is properly interactive for those students that are involved but also something that you can um, you can um, share afterwards so we certainly we can't record unless everyone that's involved has given their express permission for it but at, at this stage I'm thinking that we'll ask for that permission to just share within the group that is involved anyway so only those that would have accessed it um live if they possibly can um and then it'll only be available for a time limited um period that's that's very much at the moment mm. but happy so, for ideas <laughs> i mean speaking with my brownie hat on you need express permission for the students to be involved for their audio for their video to be visible for the other people anyway so adding in a thing to say we would like to record this for people who can't see it live you're already asking for permission so it's it's not much of an extra step um and it could be that people who aren't comfortable being recorded aren't don't necessarily join in with the live session but do join in just via seeing a recording and chat um what do the other speakers think so, so i'm Go Sorry. Sorry, it's Deanne. Um, so um, slightly outside of the kind of Zoom world, if I think about the, the great science share cam campaign, which is about driving um, the curiosity of young people, the permission, is it being explicitly given by um, uh, the parents and the carers of those um, young people and or through the schools? So you might have remembered on that whistle stop tour of slides, um, one of the big parts of that campaign is actually seeing science in action and curiosity in action um, from the young people's perspective. So there's guidance about where to do that filming and, and what considerations you might want to do. But the permission is explicitly coming from the parents, parents parents and teachers so um, I think if you think about when we would normally go out and do outreach and then we want to be taking photographs it's that same kind of scenario where um, instead of you taking the photograph and then posting up the tweet you're actually handing that functionality over to the school or to the teacher or to the parents um, to do that overtly themselves and by token give um, permission to do so.
was someone speaking? Um, so the only thing I would I would probably add um, to this is that Oxford in particular has had to adjust to online at a pace previously thought not possible. Um, <laughs> anyone familiar with Oxford will know that things move excessively slowly around here. Um, so actually, yeah, thinking about things like that was one of the major talking points when we were thinking about doing our open day online. Um, how do you simulate that interaction that you get with people during an open day where you're talking and they're talking to each other, um, but without actually being allowed to let them talk to each other because that could have some really bad implications. So in the end, we settled on a situation where we would film and show them, but actually the way that they interacted with us and by proxy almost with each other is by asking questions on a on a site where everyone could see it, but we could moderate um, what would go in. Um, so I guess it's only a, a small example and doesn't encompass everything. Um, but I think, Sam, your point about not excluding people if they don't want to be recorded um, is really important, particularly if you want to make sure that you're reaching everyone you want to reach. Great, thank you. Um, Katie, you wanted to add something about editing videos on this? Yeah, I think it will depend largely on what platform you're using. So um, on things like Blackboard Collaborate, it does let you record sessions, but I'm not sure to what extent you can then do anything with that recording, like whether you can actually do any editing on it or uh, things like that. With So we record these sessions on Zoom and that just gives you a video file that you can then do stuff with. Uh, and we obviously had a lot of chat last week about video editing and doing that kind of thing. Or there may be people in your department with the ability to, uh, or, or in the media department of the uni with the ability to do that kind of editing. So if it is a case of, you know, it's a recording of the speakers doing the session with a few bits where like students have chipped in and those bits just need cutting out, that kind of thing might be possible. Um, if it then leaves you with something that you can share without kind of safeguarding concerns. Um, and I think the other thing that occurred to me is that it, it kind of almost sounds quite intimidating, the idea that now to do a session, you need to make sure you've filled in all this paperwork. Um, but there will almost certainly be people within unis that have got experience of that kind of thing that, have, you know, that know what, what the official things are that need doing. And it may be not nearly as much work as it sounds just to, you know, put some kind of indemnifying statement out there to say this is going to be recorded or to say, you know, the, these are the parameters that we're working in for this session. So, um, you know, it, it might feel like a bit of an intimidating thing to, to try and sort out all the safeguarding stuff, but there will almost certainly be someone either in the department or within the uni that has experience of that that can maybe help you. Um, that's, that was what I was going to say. Lovely. And that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we take questions for these in the chat and then whoever's doing the Q&A reads them out is so that no one who doesn't want to be has to be on screen but if you are working with young people I'll, I'll underline again um, you need permission anyway to do anything so make sure you've got that. Um, I know Francesca's got a question Francesca you are usually able to hang around a little bit afterwards because we are very rapidly approaching four o'clock is it okay to ask your question? Excellent um, in which case Ben I will hand over to you for sort of last few few statements and then we will come back to some of the questions that we've got coming in after the people who need to leave at four have left. Thanks very much Sam for uh, handling all that and particularly to all our speakers I, it is traditional and I think also worthwhile to show your appreciation to our speakers uh, you can do that by clapping in front of a camera or by clicking a reaction button on zoom up to you. Um, thank you very much to all of you for contributing there will be another half an hour or so of us chatting even more informally than we have been but before we end this bit we need some feedback from you uh, we'd like to run some more of these talking maths in lockdown sessions if people find them useful and that will be decided by what uh, you want and what you will find useful so sam has just published a poll i think it was sam anyway i'm just going to guess that she was ready to click that um could you give us a quick indication of any of the topics we've put there this is not an exhaustive list and we're not going to pretend it but if there's any of those things which capture your imagination you'd like to see us run a session in this sort of format like we've been doing could you click on them now and then click uh, submit your ideas there's also a question on how often you'd like to see these sort of sessions uh, we are not going to sign our lives away and promise to run all of these we probably can't but we would like to run some if people find them useful i'll stop twittering or bleating away for a moment while you uh, do that
in case any of the speakers are feeling uh, shut out of this, uh, it, I think if you are a co-host in this meeting, no, we don't really apparently care <laughs> about your answers because you can't enter the uh, poll. Hey. We do care. It's just that Zoom doesn't allow co-hosts to answer. We apparently us. don't care, but we in fact do. Um, you can obviously get in touch with us by any of the normal means, whether it's on Twitter or on email, to let us know more ideas about what you'd like. I wonder if, Sam, could you show that, uh, share that result? Um, I suspect I could do that too, but you are handling the polls really well. So it looks like uh, there's a lot of demand for a diversity and inclusion session, um, and close second to that is a specific video editing thing. We will have a think about what we can offer and watch the website or Twitter or various emails uh, if you're on our email list to hear data on that. And it sounds like monthly is a, is a thing we can plan for. So we, we will get on with that. Can I say a thank you one final time to all our speakers? Uh, but if you do need to go now, you are welcome to do so. You are, of course, welcome to go whenever you do need to go. But we'll still be carrying on for another half an hour or so to chat a bit more informally. Um, so that's the end of the first part. Thank you very much to the four people contributing today. And uh, maybe hand back to Sam for some more Q&A chat. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ben. And thank you, everyone and everyone that needs to go. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and we'll see you again in however long. Um, for those of you that are staying, we have had a few more questions. I'm going to stop spotlighting Ben. There we go. Um, we have had a couple more questions. So let me just see who is still around. Uh, any of our speakers, do any of you need to head off at this point? No from Luciano. Deanne's all right. Morelli is here in spirit and I'm guessing Ruth is still sans video but around so um uh, francesca had a couple of questions particularly for luciano uh your maths club for primary school children they've asked could i ask how your you address safeguarding concerns because obviously this was a thing you did individually rather than through university so how did you handle that yeah oh that's me i'm sorry um, I, I didn't really, so it, we have a WhatsApp group, the neighborhood that was created because of lockdown. Uh, and I sent a message around saying, you know, I can teach maths. Is anyone interested? And a group of families said, oh, that would be great. So I, I used the, uh, uh, the teams that I have from UCL because I thought it would be safe, but there wasn't a particular concern about safeguarding. But I, I did through UCL teams and, you know, the families gave me their email addresses so that I could uh, register them. And the parents were there every single session as well. The parents were around. And uh, one of my colleagues saw me tweeting about it, so she also joined. So I had someone who wasn't from the neighborhood, but she was accepted. Um, and that was, that was it. I really, you know, I, I don't think there was particular concern about safeguarding. Also because the parents were there. By the way, the parents did not know me because I just moved to this neighborhood. So it was someone that they didn't know. But obviously, I emailed all the parents from my UCL address. You know, just thinking about those concerns that people might have. But uh, essentially, yeah, I was someone that they had never met. And I'm pleased to say that my birthday was on the 2nd of May and I had all the kids outside my house singing happy birthday, you know, so it was great. <laughs> That's lovely. But yeah, um, so, I mean, my only consideration was like to reassure the parents that I wasn't a crazy person. Well, Maybe that wasn't the right word. Uh, so, but, you know, I, I was I was employed by UCL. That, that should you know, some kind of reassurance in that sense. Francesca, 
Yeah, can I ask something else? Sorry, I don't, uh, then I'll shut up so I don't monopolize the conversation. It's just because it's something I was uh, thinking of doing, but uh, I was a bit concerned about uh, various issues. So, uh, so as far as I understood, it's something that you started uh, within the lockdown as something online. So it wasn't something face-to-face -face that then was transformed into online. So um, I was curious of the format. Um, how did you do? Where was everybody on video and allowed to ask questions, or where was it mainly through chat? And uh, did you allow breakout groups, or was it uh, just um, a session where everybody was attending? And how did you handle group conversations? Right. Um... It, it wasn't a very big group. Um, we were about six families. Uh, some of them have two children. So it was a small group. Um, it was very active. Most of the active, they were very short. They were about 30 minutes to 40 minutes. I didn't think it would lend to longer sessions. Um, most of the activities, not all of them, but most of the activities were very hands-on, you know, building mobile strips and playing with some mathematical toys and um, playing games like SAT. Um, so it, it was very active. So the kids had to be doing something. They, the parents were there. They were pri oh, the other thing that I had is that they were from different year groups. They're all primary, but not, you know, they were from year, I don't know, four to year seven. Actually, there was a year seven uh, boy. And I had to come up with stuff that everyone could do and everyone could enjoy. So it couldn't be curriculum based. So everything was, you know, was more like, let's have maths fun. You know, and I had primary school kids saying, oh, I didn't like the session today. I prefer to do topology. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, you hear things like that and it's fantastic. Um, but yeah, so I didn't have to think about those questions really. And the kids could ask questions whenever they wanted. They were very good at muting and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I... Um, um, you know, I taught them to pin me so that I was the main video for them and stuff like that. Obviously, kids are very good with technology. They learn very quickly. And so, but yeah, it, it went really well. I was surprised. It was great. It was a great experience. Also, because I had never done primary before. <laughs> so I was also learning while doing it. And so it was good. So with brownies, there's a lot of guidelines that come down from Girl Guiding, but we also put some in place for our unit and um, I sent an email out beforehand telling all the parents and carers what we expected from them during the meetings and what guidelines they had to follow. So something that Guiding has said is it can't be in girls' bedrooms. Um, they've also said that there has to be an adult present in the room. We yeah. added a few things in like reminding parents and carers that other people in the room can be seen and heard. So making sure that there weren't things in the background going on that shouldn't be shared with other children of the age of their daughters and things like that. So um, we added in sort of all of those, sort of remember this because people aren't necessarily as as sort of familiar with these sorts of oh actually your microphone can pick up background conversations and stuff um so we we sent something out and made sure all the parents and carers agreed to it before we started doing meetings we also use zoom because apart from anything else you can mute all the girls and things like that actually we found their behavior on the zoom calls particularly in terms of talking over other people and things like that have been far better than in person. Um, I wish I had a mute meeting in our normal, mute button in our normal calls, uh, halls. But to be honest, we haven't had to use it. They've all been really, really good about it, um, which has been fantastic. What have the other speakers found with, with doing sessions for seven sort of age groups? Anything in particular that you'd like to highlight? 
I think one of the things in Zoom um, where you mentioned if you're the organizer and you can kind of control the chat is that we switched off um, the private chat function. So then if, if something was happening, it would only come to everyone and it could either be knocked on the head right then and there. And also um, because if you then um, you might not see the private conversations going on between people. So for some uh, engagement activity, we've just simply taken that particular function away. Yeah, very similarly um, for, for us, um, we are not allowing private chat between participants um, and yeah, everything's going to be fully moderated and like um, the letter that's gone out to so the guiding, um, you know, within the code of conduct, we we're also reminding people about the backdrop um, and about sound and um, making sure that they're, they're aware of all that themselves. But we're also choosing to, um, to mute the mics and stop the video um, for a lot of what we're doing to just prevent any possibility of an issue. Um, so most of the, the interactivity will end up being through written chat. Um, it's a, uh, yeah. It's yeah, safest we, way. We've um, turned off the, the individual chat buttons here as well as people know. Um, I think the option to leave the private chat on is a standard thing in your zoom account she says um trying desperately to find it uh let me have a look if i can see in the settings I, now i'm gonna share if you my click screen. the yeah the three buttons in the chat window as a host i think you have some options oh that's a new thing i also had it in my in my settings so i'm gonna share my screen now um, she says, slightly concerned that there'll be some personal information on there that she doesn't want recorded. No, we're good. We're good. Um, How to demonstrate safeguard. Yes. Do not judge me for the number of tabs that are open. Going to say that now. Um, right. Can you see my screen? No. Almost. It's coming. It's coming. There it is. There we go. Okay. Lovely. So in my settings um, over here, on the left uh, there's lots of things i've not allowed join before host for example um, i have said that personal meeting id i don't use it um, i've said that passwords have to be required i also change my password as well just in case because zoom's default is a string of um, numbers and i don't want people to be able to sort of brute force that um, i have muted people upon entry I've required passwords for people joining by phone and things like that. Private chat is turned off. Um, I th think there is a standard thing that you can just have standard. They, I'm sure there used to be a thing on there saying that you could. No, I've lost it. There used to be a thing there saying that you can turn chat on for hosts, but I think that's just a standard thing, Fran. So I would assume that if you test it, you can send a chat to your co-host. Bear in mind that if you set settings on your account and then you um, start a meeting, you can't then change the settings halfway through the meeting. So. Yeah, but we um, we did a session a couple of weeks ago on different video software and things like that, where we discussed a lot of these things. And I think most of us are happy to um, discuss sort of the, the various options that we've put in place here in terms of security and safety and stuff like that. So do ask us. And thank you, Katie, for sharing the Girl Guiding Guidance for online meetings. That is very, very helpful. They also do a rundown of different platforms, which is very helpful as well. Um, right, there was another question that now I have lost. Oh, yes, uh, it was about open days and good lengths for open day talks, given that you might have more than one talk. What are people's thoughts on that? 
So based on our experience um, from April, you definitely don't want talks to be too long. Um, as we know, people have a bit of a limited attention span when things are online. Um, what we actually did was use some of our recorded talks from previous open days, which were about half an hour long. Uh, we made them available for people to watch at any time. And then on the day, our admissions coordinator, James Monroe, just did a short um, admissions talk, so explaining all the processes of, of applying to Oxford, um, including um, a map question and a little bit about what might be asked in interviews. Um, and then we actually spent the rest, so that was about the, the first half an hour of our two-hour session, and the, the next one and a half hours uh, was spent on Q&A, where the students could ask questions, we related similar questions together, um, and then he would answer them live. Um, and that seemed to work really well because we gave them the basic information, but most of that information is available online anyway. Um, but then we could actually respond to their specific queries and tease out some of the nuances that people um, were asking about. So clearly there were a lot of questions about how the pandemic is affecting things, which we wouldn't normally get at an open day. So it was nice to be able to answer relevant things um, and not just have talks where there's no interaction with anyone. I think that point about um, the opportunity for building in little bits of interactivity is really important. So I really like that, you know, you had pre-recorded online things that the kind of intro was kept to 30 minutes and then it was mostly handed over to Q&A. But I guess, um, I can't remember who said they were using um, Kahoot or something. Um, I think the more opportunities we have, even if you just ask people to give, um, so what's your energy level? Where are you? Are you really low? Are you really high? Are you in the middle? Just that also physically gets people moving, just those little points where you're handing, in effect, the conversation back over to other people, I think. Um, certainly in my kind of training world, I've realized that's even more important than when you're in the room with people to keep the energy going and to keep handing um, the opportunity over. I also saw uh, people doing quick little um, polls of, you know, on a scale of one to five, Tell me, uh, what's your interest in maths? Oh, well, it's a five, obviously. What's your interest in biology? Oh, it's a one. So I think you kind of want to try and build in as much physicality as you can. Great, thank you, both of you. Um, in terms of other questions and things, we as organisers had quite a long chat about sort of the topics for this session and we found ourselves asking similar sorts of questions that we we thought might come up in the chat here so i'm i'm gonna bring up some of those as well seeing as we don't have any more specific ones at the moment um unless one of the other organizers wants to actually i'll i'll, I'll ask katie to ask uh the the sort of the next most pertinent one that she was thinking about when we were discussing this yesterday yeah. i mean it like it's it's obviously completely dependent on on where you're at and what your university's at and how busy people are and so on and so forth but uh, one thing that occurred to me was that given that kind of in-person activities and workshops can't necessarily happen at the minute is this a good time to think more about developing content for the future because i know uh, it's sort of been vaguely mentioned that some people have been doing a slightly different type of work than what they would usually do in order to kind of prepare things and develop online stuff but you know even if we're thinking further ahead you know a year from now we might be doing in-person workshops again um you know can you sit down with other people in your department in the virtual sit down sense you know on a zoom call or whatever uh, and maybe plan some new content for workshops or, or um you know is it a good time to get some training in to come and talk to your staff about doing outreach in general um because i know there's quite a lot of people who do that kind of thing in the normal times who are still delivering that kind of training but in an online form now um, and in fact so we've, we've done another one of our ridiculous um, google doc shared things uh, in which we tried to collect a few sort of resource for this i've just been putting in some links from uh, the chat from things that people have said uh, so there's another one of these ones where everyone is free to edit the document for now just to kind of add in um, uh, any suggestions or ideas or or just even talking points uh, in this as well uh, and we'll hopefully share a link to that before the end of the session um, and we'll, we'll include this in in the email to everyone i guess um, 
but yeah, like do any of the other speakers have any thoughts about, um, you know, whether, whether that's a productive use of time at the minute? I guess if other things can't be happening. I, I think it's always uh, good to be planning ahead and um, yeah, take every opportunity. So yeah, we've um, all been encouraged to take as much sort of and as many training opportunities as possible in this period. So, um, yeah, I, I, th I think it's a good idea. What, what's hard is just not knowing when you can next do something face to face. <laughs> um, so at the moment, I think a lot of our thoughts are just yeah, how we can do this differently rather than what we'll do when things get a bit more back to normal. But yeah, I think throughout the whole period, just looking at um, new and different things is a, a great thing to do. Yeah, one of the um, one of the things I would say in our job is we always always complaining we don't have enough time to spend on innovating new things. You're always busy running the existing thing and you don't have time to think about the next thing. Um, so this is this is a great time for that. I think the past couple of months has been spent scrabbling around trying to work out how on earth we're going to deliver the things that we used to deliver in real life suddenly online. So there's not been enough time to do that. But I think if things are settling down for the foreseeable future and we think that actually for the next year we're not going to be able to deliver those online uh, sorry those in-person events then i think there will be enough breathing space where we say okay we've got the hang of doing some of it online um how do we plan now for the future how can we actually get some new activities and i'm i'm on furlough so i'm not allowed technically to do anything official but that doesn't stop me from thinking creatively about things I might do in the future um, and doing some training courses or um, professional development type things whilst, whilst I'm off. Um, so now that nurseries are back, um, I actually have headspace. Um, so I can, I can actually look at some of those things now. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with the previous speakers. And I think one of the things that I personally feel has kind of um, upped my own uh, professional development and skill level is the rise of all the online communities. So the talking mass in public, the virtually social with um, Jamie Gallagher on a Friday, uh, the NCCPEs um, PEP together. And suddenly you've got access to all of these um, people that you otherwise wouldn't have access to in terms of their insights and that sharing of challenges and opportunities and I think um, rather than just thinking about um, formal training I've seen this real rise in this set of online connections and I think in outreach in public engagement and science communication we've always been very generous people in sharing what we do how we do it why we do it what doesn't work and I've just seen that level of thoughtfulness and kindness in the online communities for people like us and beyond really just go to the power 10. Sorry, that's probably a really bad maths reference and you're all cringing. But um, I just think um, I'd hate to lose that opportunity going forward where suddenly we all go back in into indoors in terms of our disciplines and our subject matters and our institutions and we lose this richness of giving because I think that actually has been one of the real opportunities during this crisis. Luciana, I think you wanted to add something as well. Yeah. Um, it's, um, I think within the group I work with doing outreach, um, after a certain period of being a bit lost, uh, there was a lot of excitement about learning how to use new technologies. Well, not new technologies, of learning how to use technology to deliver outreach um, and learn how to, you know, re record a nice video and edit. And, uh, and I think that if anything, well, instead of thinking of what we're going to do after lockdown, I think at least in my group, what we all seem to want to do now is to learn how to do things remotely. Um, you know, like we never had a YouTube channel. We are launching it and we are, you know, and hopefully this will go on after lockdown is over. You know, so I think it was, I think if anything, we wanted um, training about those things. 
you know, and talk about those things, you know, that we're doing now because we want to carry on doing them once lockdown is over. Yeah, well, one of the um, trainers that I've linked to on here, uh, yeah, I think is, is Sally LePage, who's a YouTuber who does YouTube videos professionally. Wow, um, and she's specifically got a training course for academics to teach them how to make videos. So, Perfect. you know, and th there's obviously plenty of other places out there. So this is, uh, I should caveat a list of people that we are aware of that we think are not rubbish, but we're obviously not kind of... Uh, you know, if you have a bad experience with any of these people, it's not our fault, essentially. Um, and likewise, but, uh, yeah. any absence of someone from the list who is also not exactly, rubbish does yeah. not mean we didn't think they, they were good yes, enough. That is, yeah, it's just been like, here are some people that we know of that we've worked with or that we're familiar with or we've had a recommendation of. And ob obviously this document is now editable. So anything that is on there could have come from anywhere, including not us. So that's a uh, little bit of caveat on there. But yeah, there, there's, there are things like this that people can learn. And I think it was Marilee mentioned earlier that um, there were things that you were meaning to do in terms of moving outreach online because you know it's generally a thing that that is an increasing thing that people might want to do but this has been kind of a spur that's sort of nudged you into doing that which I think is potentially one of possible uh, upside whatever we're calling them <laughs> um, uh, to this whole thing that's been going on so that's kind of cool. Anything else Sam? Any other questions? Um, yeah one thing I will add is that uh, of those trainers on there there is someone called Sarah Cosgriff who is brilliant and who doesn't have a website so she sent us details of the training that she can do and we'll think about how we can best share them with you um, because obviously we're not copying and pasting everyone's training details into the document because then it would be excessively long um, but we'll, we'll have a think about that because there's some some good stuff on there um, just in the last couple of minutes I know we've talked about this on and off but I just wanted to get some final thoughts from people as to whether there was anything to do with um, being inclusive and creating for different catering for different types of diversity that you feel is really important when considering doing your outreach online that we haven't already discussed? Everyone's looking contemplative. I'm um, not sure if it's, I don't think we discussed that, but uh, our main concern was to be to have closed captions, for example. So that was the thing that we um, were more concerned about in terms of accessibility. Uh, you, also, did you manage to make that happen, or was it just a wish? Uh, yeah, we, we well, that's we haven't launched, but the idea. Yeah, so David is is going to I think is going to use YouTube facility to do that and then edit. And then put it back there. Okay, that's what that's his plan. It is interesting to know that Google services like via Google Meet uh, will do a version of closed captioning live. It's not perfect, obviously, but it does provide an upgrade from nothing. Sure, that's a, it depends on the service, doesn't it? The yeah, we've we've got a, a couple of events this weekend as part of Chatham Science Festival, and for one of them, they are using the closed captioning in Zoom, uh, which is something that we've sort of looked at and played with. But the way it works is there is just the facility for someone to type um, closed captions, and you can hire in professionals who can type very very quickly, presumably using some form of shorthand uh, keyboard, um, but that, that can actually do that live. Uh, as you're talking which I've oh. not had that done before and that's going to be terrifying and interesting um like when I've had interpreters doing sign language and things it, it kind of does sort of uh you know it, it's, it's a thing that you sort of notice and adapt to but I think with this it will just be the the text coming on the screen for anyone who's got that switched on so I maybe won't even notice it happening and I'm interested as to how that comes across as well um but yeah so any, anything that gets uploaded to YouTube it will automatically generate some uh slightly imperfect auto-generated subtitles which you can then go in and fix and that's something we're currently in the process of doing for the previous team sessions which we are any day now going to manage to get that finished it's I, I'm, like it depends how picky you are how long it takes really if you're happy with it just having no punctuation in just going all the way through uh, then it's fine uh, as it is as long as you fix any typos um, but yeah it's I think Sam takes longer maybe that's more of like perfectionist. slightly more perfectionist yeah um but you know that's that's one way to to kind of make that happen and there are professional services that do captioning for videos and and produce transcripts of things as well that you can send stuff off to and get that kind of thing done
any other final thoughts before? No, excellent. Um, I think Katie, you wanted to, <laughs> Lawrence is saying proper grammar is important. Thank you, Lawrence. I now feel justified in taking many, many hours to do very short amount of captions. Um, Katie, did you want to say a couple of things before we head off? Uh, is this re with reference to a specific thing or just that, uh, that I look like a message, message saying that you oh, that was said ages you ago. wanted to? Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's, okay. there's something I'll, I'll throw out there before we finish, just um, because things, even since the beginning of lockdown, some of the things we've been discussing in these things have changed. So I remember one of our first sessions in Teamit, we talked about online platforms like Google Meet, Zoom, everything else. And it's noticeable that even the advice we wrote down together a few weeks ago has changed. So for example, Google Meet now has an audio share thing, which previously we were like, oh, Zoom's the only one that seems to manage to share audio. So all these things are changing. And I think things like the closed captioning thing are getting better much quicker than we ever expected they would. Um, and so keep sharing things that you notice if someone needs a particular use case, uh, just you know, use our communities we've got. This is really a really yeah. helpful group um, of people. So I think what we're going to try and do is, especially once we've got all of the videos up um, on the Talking Matters in Lockdown page on the website, we're going to add um, the Google Docs that we've produced for each of the sessions that we've done one for. Um, they have been editable by anyone, but I think we're probably going to switch that off before we put the live link on our website, uh, at which point we might make it something like comments only so people can still add comments. And if there is anything useful that people add in the comments, we'll integrate it into the document. Um, but the stuff that's up there is there's some really useful links and useful uh, advice and stuff. Uh, again, with the caveat that all of it has been contributed by the community. So we're not responsible for anything uh, that is said in there, uh, but please find it useful if you can. Um, Deanne's just pointed out that Jamie did a virtually social on accessible engagement. He did. I was one of the speakers. Um, one of the things that I particularly mentioned, possibly remembered to mention during that, possibly didn't, is making sure that there are alternatives. So people can't always access things live. They can't always give over the bandwidth or the amount of internet that it takes to, to watch a video, make sure there are alternatives for people to get involved in different ways if you can, is that was the main thing on that. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you everyone, for especially to our speakers today. It's been really, really insightful hearing all the things that you've been doing and are continuing to do and are planning to do whilst obviously not doing any work, just happen to have thoughts in your head, um, which is also what many of us on furlough are doing at the moment. And to all of you for giving up your time, particularly those of you that have, have joined us over multiple weeks. It's been lovely to see and hear you every week. It's been really, really nice to um, get together. So thank you very, very much. And team meal will continue in some form and we yeah. will let you know. <laughs> yeah, the, the details which should go out on the uh, team at mailing list, which if you signed up for these sessions, you'll have been given the option to sign up for the team at mailing list as well. And if you have, uh, you will be added to that and you should get an email about future sessions or just keep an eye on our website where we will put things and Twitter as well, probably, if we remember because we're terrible at social media. Following the individual presenters uh, is possibly more successful sometimes than uh, the, uh, the team app account itself, which gets passed around a bit. Yeah, yeah. Cool.